go with the message today. In God We Trust is the series that we do every summer. And we have a lot of these. If you want to check them out, you can purchase them or you can go online, get them for free. And uh, people on Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Lincoln, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, we've done a lot of stuff. Today, certainly uh, something brand new. And I hope it's a blessing not only to you, but a lot of people who click our site. And who knows, maybe one day this will be a special message to a lot of people. I'm hoping that it will be, because it was special to me putting it together. A forgotten founding father, Lemuel Haynes. Say that with me. Lemuel Haynes. I don't want you to forget his name. Say his name with me. Lemuel Haynes. What does he have to do with me, preacher? I got up today, I, I had to go through the crazy parking lot, said hi to the cop, went all the way around. I mean, I mean I'm here and you're talking about Lemuel Haynes. Why ain't you talking about Jesus? Oh, we gonna get there. Come on. You all right? Say. Lemuel Haynes, a forgotten founding father. We're rolling. The Declaration of Independence. What's the fourth of July about? It's celebrating the Declaration of of independence. Say that with me. The 4th of July is about celebrating the Declaration of Independence. Okay? That's what it's all about. In America's history, hang in here with me now. If you're thinking about dozing, that's not going to be a good thing. Ain't going to be good because I'm going to come back down on you. No, I'm not. Anyway. In America's history, no document is more important and beloved, say it with me, than the what? Declaration of Independence. Nothing even comes close to the Declaration of Independence. Amen. Okay? So, but what does the Declaration of Independence actually declare? What does it say? For most Americans today, the answer is embodied in the opening sentence, say it with me, of the second what? It's the opening sentence to most of us today. It means that opening sentence in the second paragraph. Let's read that opening sentence of the second paragraph because that's what the Declaration of Independence means to us today. This is the most quoted thing probably in, in American history. Okay? These lines right here. Would you quote them with me? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Without bragging, how many would say, oh, you could probably at least do 75% of that before we put up on the screen? You sort of knew about like... See, that's, mo that's a lot of the audience today. First sentence, second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. Keep looking. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What does that mean? Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Self-evident means it's obvious to everyone. That's what the word self-evident means. It's obvious that man should be free. To every man, every woman, black, white, does not matter. There's something that beats inside of a man that says, I, I, I should be free. Freedom is, is the right thing for me, for my family. This, I should be free. It's self-evident because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood that the, by the things that are made, even His eternal power in God is so that they're without excuse. We're made in the image of God, and inside of us beats something that says freedom. 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 That all men are created equal. Created. What does that mean? It means to bring into existence. That's what they put in that second paragraph, first sentence, that all men are created equal. Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over the earth over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Say verse 27 with me. So God what? Created who? Man in His own image. And that's exactly what they put in there. Did you know that? Yes or no? Declaration of Independence. All men are what? 
just came from a bunch of slime? Did it say that? Yes or no? That all men came from a big bang? No, all men are what? Created. That's what it says. That's what the Scripture says. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? Living soul. Now keep watching. That they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. The word unalienable, word we don't use a lot. It just means it's on the inside of you. It's in your DNA. You just know it. God created man with certain unalienable rights. Things that, are, that you just know. Unless you're brainwashed or under control of man. Maybe over centuries, who knows. But there's something inside that says, I should be free. They put that in there. Certain unalienable rights. That among these, say it with me, are what? Life and the liberty. We have the statue of liberty. We sing songs about liberty. What does liberty mean? Liberty means freedom to speak what you want, choose what you want, and be what you want. Say it with me. Liberty means freedom to what? Speak what you want, choose what you want, and what? No wonder this is pretty popular, huh? This first sentence of the second paragraph. Now, you ain't going to sleep on me yet, have you? Because if you made it through this, this is sort of the boring part. Oh, yeah! We're facing to kick it up a notch. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind. Say this part with me. Two, set at what? Liberty. Them that are bruised. And so, here we have, first sentence, second paragraph, the most famous thing of the Declaration of Independence. Are y'all with me so far? You've got to know that. You might say, Clark, I thought we were talking about Lemuel Haynes. Well, we're getting there. Give me a minute. I'm not going to talk about him unless you get this down. That part right there. That's the part you know about the Declaration of Independence. How many can stand up today, right now, and quote all the charges that were made in the Declaration of Independence against the King of, of uh, Britain? Can you do it? Can anybody stand up and name every one of them? And just quote it. Interesting. Now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. Now hang in here with me. No sentence in American history is better known or has greater impact than these powerful words about equality and rights. We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident that all men are created equal been endowed by their Creator with certain what? Unalienable rights. And these are, they can pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Amen? So, let's go with the message. Here we go. So that's how you are today on the last Sunday in June, 2014. This is what we think about the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, first sentence, second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We're created equal. We're free, man. Yeah. That's what we think. But in 1776, when this was written, that's not how most Americans would have seen the Declaration of Independence. Are you hearing me? No, they could have stood up and quoted the charges against the king of Britain, which you can't do. They wouldn't have quoted that little part. The first sentence of the second paragraph. How many are like, oh my gosh, Clark's going crazy. His back went out again. Here we go. The entirety of the now famous second paragraph was little more than a minor premise in the argument over independence. 
It was a little blip on the big screen of things. They didn't even hardly see it. Americans at the time rarely discussed these words. You wouldn't have heard them in 1776, 1777, 1780, 85, 90, 95. It gives me 1800. You wouldn't have heard them saying to an audience, who can stand up and go, we hold these truths to be... But probably they could have stood up and named the charges against the king. Are you hearing me or not? You might say, but where are you going? Well, Americans at that time rarely discussed these words instead of focusing on the long list of charges against King George III that dominated the body of the Declaration of Independence. Look how much that took. This is the Declaration of Independence. Now, look, these are all the signatures. You can see the big John Hancock right there. My goodness, it's two-thirds of the whole thing is the charges against the king. Is that right, yes or no? You want to find out those charges? Go online. We've got a whole message just about the charges. That's what they focused on. And the final section declaring there at the very end, it's in bold letters, big bold letters when you look at a copy of the Declaration of Independence. Declaring the colonies, say it with me, to be what? An independent what? They saw the charges. They saw free and independent states, but they didn't see all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. But that's what you see today. Is that right? Say, you look at the Declaration of Independence, you don't see all the charges against the king. You see I'm free. Black, white, man, woman. We're equal. We're free. Is that what you see? The slaves, one-fifth of the United States population, to them, the Declaration of Independence meant absolutely nothing. To one-fifth of the population of the United States of America, the Declaration of Independence meant absolutely what? Nothing. 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 The charges against the king? Oh, great! Oh, great! You're free! We still belong to you, Massa. How did men, and don't get me wrong, I love our founding fathers. Our founding fathers were not perfect men. But how did our founding fathers write a document demanding freedom from the king of Britain while owning men and women and babies and not letting them be free? How could they put, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and died by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. How could they do that on the one hand and not see it on the other? It's a good question, ain't it? Say. When the Declaration of Independence was published, and by the way, they did pledge their lives and their their families and their sacred fortune by, by putting that forth the Declaration of Independence. Most of them, we did a whole series on the signers. And almost all of them lost their wealth. They lost their lives. They lost so much. The signers. They lost a lot for doing what they did. Even though they didn't really see what they did. Part of it, they didn't see what they did. They didn't see what they wrote. When they made the decision and it was printed in the newspaper, the first newspaper to print it was a paper in Philadelphia printed the Declaration of Independence right after it happened. And as a matter of fact, the Pennsylvania Evening Post newspaper article first announcing the colonies free and independent states, when you opened the paper, it was posted right next to 
a runaway notice offering a reward for the return of a black man named Ishmael. We're free! Free! Oh, by the way, if you catch this guy, we'll kill him. Makes you scratch your head sometimes and wonder how America ever became free, doesn't it? Say yes or no. I'm not here picking today on the founding fathers or anything like that. They were awesome. Were they perfect? No. Were they wrong in a lot of areas? Sure. Are you perfect? No. Are you wrong in some areas? Yeah. You see that we ain't changed a whole lot, have we? Except we're free today. We're free. When did the focus change? Hope I didn't lose you yet. How many are still awake? Say. You still awake? Okay, good, 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 good. Got four of you. Here we go. Come on. When did the focus change? When did it change from being able to be charges against the king? Two, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain unable rights. When did it change? When did the focus change? How did America's diplomatic severance notice to the king turn into a declaration of individual rights and the natural equality of all people. When did it change? While most Americans, listen to me, while most Americans were focusing on the severance notice to the king, you're not our king anymore. We're going to be free. This is why we're going to be free. Bang, 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 bang. All the list. While most Americans were focusing on the severance notice to the king, one group of people, one group, saw the most important statement in the whole thing was the first sentence in the second paragraph. Are y'all hearing me today or not? Are y'all listening or not? Have I ticked you off yet? Good. We hold these truths that's what they saw. To be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they're endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Who were these people that saw this? Keep looking. Slaves. And opponents of slavery. You sit here today, and I sit here today, and stand here and talk. And I can quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Not only because it was written, but because somebody saw it. And it meant something to them. Are y'all hearing me or not? Don't think we're going to take forever because the cop's out front and i got to be done early today. One of those men who saw it was a man named Lemuel Haynes. He saw something. He's a forgotten founding father, but he ain't forgotten no more by me. And anyone who ever listens to this message on radio, YouTube, Television, Lemuel Haynes, no longer forgotten today. Who was Lemuel Haynes? He was born in 1753 in West Hartford, Connecticut. He was an abandoned child of an African father and a white mama. Lemuel Haynes. At the age of five months old, he became, say it with me, the indentured servant until the age of 21 to a man named David Rose of Granville, Massachusetts. What is an indentured servant? Well, now he ain't a slave. He's an indentured servant. What that is, it's a binding contract that binds him to David Rose as basically property until the age of 21. So people that say, well, in the North they didn't have slavery. No, you had something that was sort of clever. It's called indenturement and things like that. It still wasn't freedom. Are you hearing me, yes or no? Say. 
And no five-month-old ought to have to have a contract like that. Amen. He served as an agricultural worker, but the indenture required him to be what? Educated. Required some education for him. Okay? Got to educate him. Well, a mule had a passion for books, especially the what? The Bible! He could read, man. And he read God's Word. At the age of 20, Lemuel Haynes personally accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. How do I know? Even Wikipedia says it. Man, if Wikipedia says you saved, you're probably saved. You know how people say, I'm a believer, but you know how that goes. Yeah. Been reading the Bible. He looked out on one night. And saw something, you know, you see stars sometimes, or how the sun will look. How the sky looks at night, and it just makes you think, wow, what an awesome God. And it all started to click for Lemuel. And he hit his knees, put his faith in Christ. When freed from indenture in 1774, he is 21. Haynes joined the Minutemen of Granville, and he marched in several different missions. After the war, he turned down the opportunity to study at Dartmouth College. Interesting right here. And he chose rather to study what? And with clergymen in Connecticut, now we learned last week, first message, old school, if you want to go check it out, one of the old school rules. First rule of Harvard in the late 1600s, first rule, first rule of Harvard, number one rule was that you must know Greek and Latin. And 106 of the first 108 colleges in America were, met, were colleges to train ministers to preach the gospel. Harvard was the first in America. So why did Lemuel, Lemuel turn down Dartmouth? Because he wanted to study God's Word. So he chose rather to learn Latin and Greek. Did you catch that or not? We learned that last week. Haynes was licensed to preach in 1780. And would you say this with me? He was the first what? Black person in America to serve as pastor of a what? Okay. He served as pastor in several little places at first, but he settled down as the pastor of Rutland Parish in Vermont for 30 years. Stayed a long time. He received an honorary master's degree from Middlebury College. I've been there in Vermont several times. He's the first black person, say that with me, the first black person in what? To receive such an acknowledgement or a degree. Have you learned anything yet today? Say. Sure you have. I really wonder how many people would know this. Pretty good information. But we still haven't got to the heart of the matter yet. His home and church for the last 11 years of his life was in upstate New York at Granville Congregational Church. That's where he ended his ministry. He died in 1833 at the age of 80. And like I said about Webster, though he's dead right now, I ain't dead yet with his message. I ain't done. Hang on. Hang on. Lemuel Haynes, a forgotten founding father. Why, Clark, are you preaching about this man? Why is Lemuel Haynes a forgotten founding father? I still don't get it. Talk to me, you're killing me. Well, because he was one of the first people to focus on the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. He's one of the first ones that ever wrote anything about that little sentence. While everybody else saw the charges, he saw that sentence. In his own writings, Lemuel Haynes referred to himself as a mulatta, which means mixed race, black and white, mixed together. When he would write things, he would refer to himself as that.
I remember going to West Rockingham School, and I'm in that picture. Where am I at, Rog? That's me when I was a boy. I had hair that grew every. It was craziness. Can we get rid of that picture and back it up? Thank you. I remember one year when school started. And this ain't going to be long in the message. It was, I believe they were twins. A brother and a sister were new students at West Rockingham Elementary School. And I'm from Rockingham, North Carolina. Deep South. And I remember when they came. I guess the year would have been like 19, maybe 72, something like that. And I remember seeing their skin was lighter colored than the other black kids. Y'all hear me? And honest to goodness, my thought was, they're beautiful. That didn't make me some great guy. <laughs> that was just my thought. But I remember the insults that they received from both blacks and whites. Did you hear me, yes or no? And they were just two beautiful little kids. Lemuel Haynes was not ashamed of who he was. His daddy was a black man who had abandoned him. And his mama, according to history, I guess was of some financial background, had some money, family had some money, but somehow she didn't keep the baby. And at five months, he became an indentured servant. But he was proud of who he was. Called himself a mulatto. Okay, you got that part? In the summer of 1776, I'm imagining it would have been September, you know, August, September, Declaration, July 4th. In the summer of 1776, Haynes wrote a manuscript essay invoking the Declaration's self-evident truths that all men, all men, all men, even a man like me, are created equal and we're endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. He saw it. Therefore, making what? Slave keeping what? He saw something. It's the law of the land. The black man also has undeniable rights to liberty, he wrote. Haynes pointed out the irony of the slave owners fighting for their own liberty while denying it to others. And if you look a little bit at his life, he was very fond of the founding fathers and was very grateful for them and for what they did. But he just thought it was ironic that you write such a thing and don't see what you wrote. Are you hearing me today? But what they wrote is what we remember. Isn't that cool? Say you're free today because of this. 2 Peter 2.19, he knew the Bible well. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. What a great scripture. Haynes wrote, Liberty is equally as precious to a black man as it is to a white one. And bondage is equally intolerable to the one as to the what? Can we say that quote together? I, I think, he, I think he's, he's deserved us learning one of his, his sayings, don't you? Come on, let's try. Liberty is equally as precious to a black man as it is to a white one. And bondage is equally intolerable to the one as to the, to the other. You might say, Clark, I came to church today, and why aren't you talking about Jesus and the Bible? Well, we have been talking about the Bible. I'm giving God all the credit for everything we have in America. You listening to me or not? 
And we're fixing to get to the crux of the matter. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1826, at the Declaration's Jubilee, which is the 50th anniversary, the 50th anniversary, it wasn't just slaves anymore and opponents of slavery invoking the self-evident truths of the second paragraph of the founding creed of America. It started to take a hold. It started, people started seeing that, not just the charges. Are you hearing me today? Groups of men and who? Come on, men and who? Women began to draft declarations of their own that all men and who? Women are created what? Equal. Elise reminded me today that it was Susan B. Anthony and Stanton who got 250,000 signatures against slavery to help make slavery illegal. And for they themselves, it was, it was 50 years later before they got equal rights. Women. It's a pretty big deal, this Declaration of Independence. Are y'all hearing me or not? In 1857, Abraham Lincoln said, which is very important, very important that you get this. He wrote that the claim that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights was of no practical use in dissolving ties with Britain. It didn't need to be in there. You didn't need to put it in there. But he saw something placed there for the what? Future of the United States of America. And we're living proof today, the last Sunday in June, 2014, that the thing that didn't need to be there was there for the future. And we're the future. And it's the thing we quote the thing that didn't need to be there to be free from Britain. Did you get that? So do you know who I believe put those words there? We hold these truths to be self-evident. How could men put something there that really wasn't the case for they were making? It was really the case against the king. It embodies most of the text, their charges against the king, who put it there. Quote me, Gary talking, the Holy Spirit of the living God. Can we make some noise and praise the Lord? Come on! <laughs> Kid me? Who put it there? I believe, man, you tell me, no wonder Eisenhower said our, you know, our motto, and it was it's on our coins from way back in the day, and finally he made it the law. In God we trust. You think those men gave us the freedom that we have today? Has sustained America? Are you kidding? You're smoking something's what you're doing. God Almighty, Holy Spirit of the living God. Men who had in their chest, they wanted freedom from Britain. And God said, man, let's don't forget about the other folk either. <laughs> okay? And even though it takes us a while sometimes because we're thick-headed and we're sinners, right? Say, aren't you glad God's patient with us? He put something in the Declaration of Independence that you and I today treasure. He put it there. He put it because it is all about him right there. Isn't that all about him? Say, we're his creation. He created us. Certain rights were made in his image and his likeness. This really was all about him and us being free. And you shall know the what? And the truth shall set you free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. Can you say it with me? Not a whole lot on Lemuel Haynes today. I thought the whole thing was going to be about him. Well, no. Because what he wrote was never published. Got to shut him up. And honestly, for the rest of his life, Lemuel Haynes, he preached the gospel. 
He was a good preacher. He didn't go around making trouble. and He preached that gospel because he knew that preaching of the Word was what it was really about and was going to change a man. And so he, he stayed true to his calling, kept preaching. What he, print, what he wrote was never really printed. That's why people don't hardly ever see it. But it's been discovered. Amen? And we discovered it in fellowship too, didn't we, today? Amen. Say it with me, would you? Loud. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can you say our national motto with me? Here it is on the screen. Say it with me. In God we trust. You mean national motto? Yeah, it's your national motto. You don't have three of them. you got one of them. Say it with me again. In God we trust. Can we say it loud? Come on. In God we trust. Now, can we thank the Lord for a good word today? Come on. You know it was. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Fellowship meets every Sunday morning at the beautiful Lemon Bay Performing Arts Center, located on the campus of Lemon Bay High School at 2201 Placida Road in Inglewood, Florida. Our early worship service begins at 9 a.m. and the main worship service begins at 1030 a.m. Between these two worship services, we offer gourmet coffee, fresh juices, pastries, and lots of fellowship free of charge in our hospitality center. If you're looking for a church in the Inglewood area or would like to just pay us a visit, we would love to fellowship with you. For more information, give us a call at 941-475-7447 or log on to fellowshipinglewood.com. For Pastor Gary Clark and all of us at Fellowship, God bless you.